depending on how long this takes, I would like to try and do our test on Friday. Um, I'm honestly, I wrote these a while ago, so I don't remember how long these notes are. If we are unable to finish them today and it takes us into tomorrow, then I might push our test back a little bit. Um, but I want to see if we can get through all the notes today. I would like to get through them all today, um, but we'll see. So, again, we'll just kind of see if we can get through them all. Um, so, this is our last bit of notes. It feels like the ecology unit has gone on for a while. I'm okay with that because we've spent some time outside, and that's what I kind of like about this class. I kind of like that this class has some flexibility, that we can do things like that. Um, I've been working on our next unit and working on, because um, our next unit is going to be field stuff. Um, talking about field samples, I've got some really fun ideas for things we can do, um, different, like, different activities and um, different traps and things we can set up. So that's going to be our next um, unit. But anyways, um, size and area, species richness is what we're going to finish out with this unit. So most species on, few birds species live on the smallest islands and most species on the largest islands. So looking at like island size, um, that's what this particular topic is talking about. Um, so isolation reduces bird diversity on specific islands. Now islands are an interesting case. With island diversity, islands isolate. When an organism is on an island, it isolates them from things around them. Um, sometimes it's hard for them to get to the island, but once they actually get there, it's hard for them to leave. So when they're on that island, they are isolated from the things that are around them. So they have time to develop and um, adapt to that specific, specific place where they're at. So the numbers of species increases within the area. So like a lake, for instance, can be considered kind of its own like little aquatic island. Um, once they're in a lake, unless there is a stream or something connecting to that lake, that lake is an isolated area or a pond is an isolated place too. So that's why I like the ponds at the outdoor classroom. Um, I'm interested in those because yes, those two ponds are isolated, but they're close enough side by side that surprisingly, things can get from one pond to another, even a fish, because um, when they flood, it's pretty easy for a fish to get from one to the other. And with the Whitaker Pond being so close by, it could be possible for a bird to pick up a fish from the Whitaker Pond and then drop it near the other ponds, the outdoor classroom ponds, and, um, and not be fully dead. And so then, possibly repopulate one of those ponds. So I am curious if there are fish out there, and that's one of the reasons why I think it'd be fun to sample them. So immigration is, an important, is important for maintaining that diversity. And so island diversity is a big factor, but whenever we have an island, sometimes bringing organisms to those places is a challenge. So it's hard for organisms to come or leave an island, um, that is one of the biggest issues. So if we have an organism that can fly or is really good at traveling, that's going to play a big impact to these isolated places. Um, once they get there, then they do have more time to adapt to that environment. Um, it's easier for something new to mess up the balance because things that have been there a long time, they are in balance. They've reached that carrying capacity and have maintained a balance. Um, so anything new is more likely to mess up that balance. Islands that are closer to big land masses tend to have more diversity than others. So think of Madagascar that yes, it's still an island that's far away from um, Africa, but it's closer than like Hawaii, which is out in the middle of nowhere. So um, Madagascar is more likely to have species that travel from Africa than Hawaii that's you know, out in the middle of the ocean. So islands that are closer to these large land masses are going to be more likely to have a diversity of species than something that is farther away from a large land mass. And all of these are in Google Classroom. 
So this just shows how immigration works. So if you have a large land mass, you're gonna have a wider variety of species that can get to that island. Like maybe they drift over there on a piece of wood, or maybe a, a bird obviously can fly over there. Maybe it gets a really good gust of wind and it just kind of sails over there. Um, if it's a swimming creature, maybe it swims over there. Um, whereas if it's further away, it's going, I mean, it could still get over there, but it's not as likely. It's more likely to be found on something that is closer to the mainland. Um, if the land itself is bigger, there's more likely to have a wider variety of species. And that is partly because there's just more room for species to survive there. The carrying capacity is higher. A smaller island won't have nearly quite as much there just because the carrying capacity is lower. And even if we start off with a lot of things like we see here, not everything is gonna be able to survive and only the strongest is gonna survive and outcompete the others just because we don't have as high of a carrying capacity. We could have a variety here and eventually they will get outcompeted as well, again, because of carrying capacity. We might even have new things develop. So this blue one is new and it developed differently. It wasn't here with the other species originally because it was a new species entirely because on an island in an isolated situation, they were able to adapt and form something entirely different. So lakes again are very similar to that. Lakes can be viewed as like their own individual islands. Sometimes they can be connected by streams and rivers, but for the most part, they act as individual isolated areas. Um, it's becoming more interconnected as we have boats that are traveling in between places. And also now that we are stocking lakes more and we are releasing things more, people are getting more liberal with, oh, I have a pet fish or I have a water plant that I don't want anymore. So I'm just gonna go throw it in this lake or I'm gonna throw it in this pond. I've heard so many people say, oh, I got a turtle and I didn't, I can't take care of it, so I'm just going to go release it in so-and-so's pond. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, do, do you think that turtle made it? Is that, is that turtle supposed to be there? And so it's things like that. Releasing um, exotic pets into the wild is never a good thing. But lakes are um, in themselves usually isolated organisms or organs or biomasses. So patterns of species diversity on islands, as a result, their balances of immigration and extinction rates. This creates an equilibrium model. And so um, typically they find a balance over time. They become this balanced um, model where eventually that carrying capacity, carrying capacity is reached eventually an equilibrium is reached. Um, this is where the rates of immigration would be highest on new islands with no organisms. So obviously that makes sense. A brand new island forms, rates of immigration are gonna be highest because nothing is there yet. So lots of new things are typically going to travel there because there's a lot of niches that need to be filled. There's a lot of new spaces that need to be inhabited. So of course a lot of new things are going to come into this space. So as the species accumulate, rates of immigration are going to decline, and that also makes sense. Yeah, it's going to, um, you're not gonna have a lot of new things come in because there's no place for those new things to settle. So think about like, um, you know, just humans in general. If, if a group of people come and they're like, oh, there's already a bunch of people here, let's move on. There's no room for us here. There's no place for us here. We don't need doctors in this town because we've already got doctors here. We don't need teachers here because there's already teachers here. And that's a bad example because we need doctors and teachers everywhere. But you get the idea that um, there's not room because there's already things filling those spaces. So at first, in a brand new spot, you're going to have lots of organisms that are coming in. But then as those spots get taken, then, I mean, think of it as kind of like a parking lot. You're gonna come and you're gonna fill up all the parking spaces and then you're gonna have to move farther and farther down to find parking spaces and eventually the parking spaces are gonna be filled. 
and so you're going to have to move on. This shows kind of how it works. So the um, first one, the red line is species extinction, and the blue line is immigration of new species. So at first, it is really high, where there is a high immigration of new species, and then that's going to decline. And then at first, it is very low of species extinction, and then eventually that species extinction is going to ri rise. And so we have this nice middle here, and that's kind of where we're trying to get is this nice middle which is the number of species present. So that's kind of our happy place is where the two lines are going to intersect. So once we reach that kind of happy middle place, um, that's where that balance, that equilibrium is. So the rate of extinction would rise with increasing number of species on a new island for three reasons. So this is why the extinction is rising. Um, the larger pool of potential extinctions, the more animals you get, the more chance things are going to get extinct. I mean, that only makes sense. The more available animals that are there, the more chance things are going to go extinct. Also, as the number of species increases, the population size of each must diminish because as you're getting more of an individual, the, that's, not just, that's not going to be sustainable. So you're going to have to have those things diminish. And as the number of species increases, potential for competitive interactions between the species will also increase. So if you've got a lot of deer, then those deers are just naturally going to compete with each other to get more food with each other. So there has to be that competition between them that will increase to allow, um, they're going to fight over the food source. So this interspecific competition so that they are starting to try and get the same resources. I love passing things off on you guys. It's like what do you guys do? Make me do the work.
All right, so rate of immigration mainly determined by distance from source immigration. So how far it is from the original source. Um, rate of extinction determined mainly by the island size. So um, large near island supports the highest number, small far island supports the lowest number. There's a picture I think, yeah, that'll kind of make this make a little bit more sense. So right now it doesn't make the most sense, but the picture on the next slide will help it make more sense. Because small, near, and large far, I mean, that gets a little confusing, but the picture helps. Okay, so here's our main island and decreasing in community richness. So obviously the main island is going to have the most, the most stuff. And so as we get further away, we're going to have the least amount of stuff, plants, animals, whatever. So the closest island is going to have the most amount of stuff and it's going to have some traveling back and forth because that makes sense. Because we're closest to the big island, we're going to have some stuff that travels to, and we're going to have some stuff that travels away. So lots of diversity and a little bit of back and forth traveling. Now, if we are further away from the big island, there's not going to be as much traveling back and forth. Again, that makes sense because it's really far away. But there's going to be a little bit of traveling between the island A and island B because that's not quite as far. So we're going to have mostly animals and plants that are from island A travel to island B. And then a little bit more that are from island B travel to island C. So you can see that as we get further away, the diversity is going to decrease. By the time we get way out here, there's not going to be a whole lot of animals and plants that travel from the mainland to the island that's further out. Probably not much going from A to C either. But B to C a little bit, but the diversity decreases the further away that you get. So most of our diversity is going to be found closer to land. And it just kind of it's the logical, kind of makes sense kind of thing. So when we put in more graphs, we see, again, closer to mainland, farther from mainland, small islands, large islands. We get these intersecting places. Few species from a small distant, many species from a large near, and we get these intersecting places and increasing species richness coming this way. So few species from a small distant island and many species from a large distant island, you can see how they intersect on these graphs. There's not going to be a table or a graph like this on your test for you to worry about, but it is still kind of interesting to see how the graphs kind of relate to each other. All right, so um, when you're looking at how islands can be manipulated with like the area and things like that, um, this guy named Simberloff tested the effect of island area on species richness in mangrove islands. And in all cases where area was reduced, the species richness also decreased. I mean, that also kind of makes sense. It's mm -hmm. logical. Let's cut an island in half. Well, that's also going to decrease the richness, how diverse, how much, uh, how many different kinds of organisms were there. So basically what he said is, well, yeah, 
the more space you have on an island, the more different kinds of things there's going to be. But that also makes sense. If you have a big area, that's going to allow for more places for animals to spread out. And it's going to allow for more um, food and more shelter and more water and more space. And so it's going to have more richness and more variety available. I don't know why he gets all this credit. I mean, it's just kind of a logical thing to figure out. Bigger island, more richness. Makes sense to me. I can't stop yawning. Tired. Uh, just, just got done doing sociology, like a big sociology assignment. But when I'm on the couch watching a basketball game, I fell asleep. And I mean, like, I was all over the couch. <laughs> Roblox with me just a little bit. Mom. Okay, fine. Fine. Play Roblox with you for just a little bit. Just a little bit. He grabs my iPad and he like changes the Roblox game. And I'm like, patience. Patience. But that still doesn't get all the energy out. I'm like, you guys, seriously. But now, whenever I sit and like there's a recliner nearby, all they do is like kick off the recliner to swing. And so now they just like bounce my chair when I sit there. And now I just get bounced all the time. island area. Um, so whenever an island gets reduced, the amount of species also reduces. That's all this graph is showing. Not very exciting. Okay, um, so species richness generally increases from middle and high latitudes to the equator. Also not very surprising. I don't see why these people get papers and stuff written after them. Basically, closer to the equator, you get more diversity you have, you think? I mean, there's this whole rainforest thing that happens, and the rainforest is one of the greatest diversity places on Earth. Um, it's called the latitudinal gradient hypothesis. So as you get closer to the tropics, you get more stuff. And Brown, um, in 1988, grouped the hypothesis into six categories. Do we even go over those? I cut a lot of stuff out. Oh, maybe we did go over those. But I get it. I did. You don't have to write the six of them down. Um, but this idea that um, the equator provides ideal conditions for diversity um, because you have more heat, you have more water, you have more sunlight, and you combine all that together, it means more plants, and more plants means more animals, and that means more, um, more niches and more food, and it just creates this perfect conditions for lots of diversity. And then you just happen to give it a name, and then you happen to become semi-famous for it something that's obvious. 
I wouldn't do that. Stick something obvious in the pumpkins. Here's a the table. This is the table hypothesis. So here's his hypothesis and the six parts that go with the latitudinal gradient hypothesis. Time productivity, environmental heterogeneity, favorableness, niche breadth, and interspecific interactions. Apparently, to become fav famous, you have to use fancy words. Differences in speciation and extinction rates. You don't have to write this down because I gave it to you in Google Classroom. But more time for more diversification. Productivity means more energy to divide to more species. The rainforest has a lot of energy because there's a lot of sunlight, because there's a lot of, or which will give you more plants. Um, environmental heterogeneity, heterogeneity means lots of different things, allow for more places for organisms to live. More stable and less variability in climate, so you don't have winters. So that means that there's not gonna be a lot of changes that animals have to adapt to. So as long as there's no changes, then that means animals can just learn one environmental condition and just stick to it. Um, biological instead of physiological limitations. So they don't have to worry about, oh, I need a fur coat for winter because winter is not going to be an issue. Um, higher rates of speciation and lower rates of extinction. They don't have to worry about extinction so much. They, have, they can instead focus on how am I going to reproduce and therefore how can I fill in these different spaces in the environment that might not have something living there already. Um, this shows the biome, so southern hemisphere, northern hemisphere, and then the tropicals, there's considerable Considerably more land area in the tropics than any other ecological zone. So, um, just in general, there is more space available in the tropical region for organisms to live. Northern Hemisphere has a bit too, tropical has the most. Southern Hemisphere, not as much going. So there are other things that we can use to help us map where um, ecological things are, are positioned. Um, Geographic Information System, GIS, and there's also Global Positioning Systems, which is GPS. So GIS is Glo Geographic Information System, and data is often recorded on this. Um, global positioning system is more for like traveling and using like in your car, that's more for what that is. Um, geographic ecologists have access to more accurate data through this. This is really helpful, like I said, when I was doing my research with the Nyingwa daughter, we had these big handheld devices that were extremely inconvenient for GPS systems. Um, now all you have to do is pull out your phone and it can tell you your GPS location. It's super easy now. Um, if I asked what your GPS location was, all of you could pull out your phone and tell me in a matter of seconds. Um, it was not that easy. And that was, I guess it was kind of a while ago. Um, Right after I got my master's, I finished my master's in 2006, so it was 2007? 2007 that I did that. I guess that was a while ago. When was I born? Oh, five. Oh, God. What? It was that long ago? You guys were like two? Jeez. That makes me feel old. Wow, okay. Never mind, moving on. Uh, now it is much easier to track things like that as we will discover because um, we will use our tracking devices to um, 
to pinpoint locations of cool things that we find outside. Um, remote sensing refers to gathering information about an object without direct contact with it. So um, we can track things pretty easily now without having to um, interfere with it. So we can radio tag things. We can put, um, I mean, think of microchipping your pets. If we lose a pet, we can just scan the microchip to figure out what, you know, who the pet belongs to. But we can even go farther than that and we can microchip an animal and follow the animal. And, um, and sharks and shark loops. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, we used to have to have these really big collars that they place on animals to track them, but now it's so much simpler and we can put much smaller devices, which is to an advantage. One of the things we're gonna mention in um, our next unit is that in order to be successful with tracking an animal or marking an animal is you don't want to harm the animal. So whatever device you put on the animal, you need to make sure it's not going to hinder the animal in any way. And so if you have this big old radio collar on an animal, um, that could potentially draw attention to it or it could harm the animal, make it difficult for it to like catch food or something. So now with smaller devices, it's easier to track them or to um, keep, to make sure that they're not going to be harmed during the process of research. But using satellites is also helpful. Taking pictures from the sky, you can see how things are being affected like, um, oh, glaciers are melting, or how runoff is affecting the um, pollution, or how um, tides are being, um, how tides are going in and out. So there's all kinds of things we can do on a global scale using satellite pictures and satellite images. Or just use Google Earth to just explore random things just because it's fun. You guys use Google Earth for like pyramids and stuff. This is fun. Pyramids? Yeah, you can search up the pyramids on Google Earth. You can search up all kinds of things. Stonehenge. Look at Stonehenge on Google Earth. Pyramids on Google Earth. Look up all kinds of things. Just do it. Go look at the um, Eiffel Tower. Oh look, we finished the notes, good. So we can have our test on Friday. Um, your assignment is in Google Classroom. Tomorrow will be a work day to work on that. Um, we will continue with our test on Friday. And then we will start our new unit on Monday. Because we have school on Monday. That's kind of no fun, I know. Um, we will see about possibly going outside next week, although next week seems like it might be kind of cold and icky. Um, we'll see how far, like what we get, and yeah, but we do have a new assignment. Right now I'm saying that the assignment is due Friday, but I don't know, we'll see how far we get tomorrow. I may change the due date on that one. Um, I'm not completely sold with it being due on Friday. If it takes you a while after the um, work day tomorrow, I'd rather you focus on the test and work on the test. If it's if we're having, you know, if if the assignment's taken a while, I'm, I don't mind pushing that assignment off and do, having it do next week. I'd rather you focus on the test. Does that make sense? And we can turn Monday into a work day or something to work on the assignment. So focus on the test. That should be your main concern, not pushing to get that assignment done. So, questions? Okay. But definitely the water testing due Friday. The new assignment, yeah, you can go the restroom. New assignment, um, not sold on that being due on Friday. There's one problem with the water balance just paper. 